I'm excited to talk with you about advances in genetics of Alzheimer's disease. So during my talk, I will try to um, show you how new genetic insights help to uh, better prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. And so I will start with a brief presentation of Alzheimer's disease. And during my talk, I will refer to Alzheimer's disease using the term AD. I will show you how genetics is important in AD. And then I will um, explain the evolution of the genetic analysis in AD, and I will present the main genetic findings. And finally, I would like to talk about three particular areas of interest that are the future of genetic analysis in AD. So dementia is a syndrome that is characterized by a full range uh, of symptoms associated with cognitive impairment. <coughs> and in fact, there is not only one dementia, but multiple types of dementia. And the most prevalent subtype is Alzheimer's disease. There are other types, like vascular dementia, that is the second leading subtype. And one particular individual can have multiple types of dementia in the same time. And when, for instance, someone has both AD and VD, we call it a mixed dementia. Mm -hmm. So I think you know that AD is a neurodegenerative disease. And it is characterized by two particular hallmark features. So there is an accumulation of an abnormal form of a protein called tau inside the neurons, and it forms what we call tangles. But there is also a progressive accumulation of a protein called beta amyloid or A beta outside the neurons in the brain that form plaques. And uh, the main treatments on uh, AD try to focus on this second protein A beta and they try to enhance the clearance or reduce aggregation or production of A beta. So AD is a major public health problem. So it is the sixth leading cause of death in the US and it is the fifth leading cause of death among individuals aged 65 years or older. And we know that increasing age is the most important risk factor for AD. The prediction for AD are alarming, with the total number of persons affected with AD that are expected to be multiplied by more than two by 2050. And also the total cost associated with dementia and AD are expected to be multiplied by more than four by 2050. So there is a strong genetic component in AD. And so we, we say that AD is heritable. So we know that there is a greater risk to have the disease if we have a, related, a relative that has AD. And so there is a measure for that that we <coughs> call heritability. So we estimate the heritability of AD to range between 60 and 80%. So uh, it's not completely determined by genetic factor. There is also the role of environmental factors. As I said before, increasing age is the most important risk factor in Alzheimer's disease. But there are also some cases where Alzheimer's disease can appear earlier in the life. So in fact, we can divide AD into two different subtypes of disease depending on the age of onset of AD. So in 5% of the total cases, we have early onset AD, EOAD, that um, appears before 60, 65 years of age. And there is a particular form of early onset AD that is familial. And in this form of disease, it is caused by deterministic genes. It means if you have a mutation in this gene, then you will have the disease. So these mutations are really rare. And then the second subtype represents the major um, 
cases, 95%, and so it's called late onset AD or LOAD, and it appears after 65 years of age. In this case, this type is caused by multiple mutations in several genes, so we say it is polygenic, and these mutations, they are called risk factor. It means that if you have this mutation, your risk to have AD will be increased, but they are not sufficient to say if you have this mutation, you will have the disease. And in this form of late onset AD, there is a role of both genetics and environmental factors, and they both play a role in the um, onset, progression, and severity of the disease. So why do we want to search for genes in AD and why do we want to find some genes in AD? So genetic analysis can help to define two types of <coughs> treatments for the disease. We work on preventive treatments. So for instance, we try to identify particular risk factor or lifestyle that we can modify. And also, we can help to improve the risk prediction and the risk stratification for clinical trials. Genetic analysis can also help to define curative treatments. And with genetic analysis, we can answer particular questions such as what to target or whom to target. So gene discovery in AD started in 1991 with uh, family studies that try to um, find within families some particular regions of the DNA that are shared among affected individuals. So here on this picture, we have one particular family, and we can see that the region in pink here is shared between affected individuals represented in black. This type of family studies were powerful to detect rare mutations that cause the disease, such as in early onset AD. This type of studies were followed but by what we called association studies, and this type of studies aim to find mutations that are shared by affected individuals that are not present in non-affected individuals. The advantage of association studies is that they didn't need large families. And the first one that were conducted were based on candidate genes. That's why they are called candidate studies. So the genes can be selected because they were in a region detected by family studies, or they can be selected because they have a biological role that seems to be relevant for AD. And then following candidate studies, a big step was achieved with the development of commercial uh, genotyping chips, and then large-scale studies became feasible. So it is what we call, and the famous called GWAS for Genome-Wide Association Studies. These studies didn't need a priori hypothesis about the role of the gene in the disease, and they could test uh, the association between thousands of mutations on the DNA with AD. So they were really powerful to detect new genes and new mutations. Following GWAS, then we developed what we called meta-analysis. And the idea was to increase the power of genetic studies by increasing the sample size. And so we thought maybe we can combine the results of multiple studies and increase our power. So this is what we call meta-analysis. And also different consortium on AD were created. So here I listed four of them, EADI, GRAD, ADGC, and CHARGE. And all of these consortium on AD found new genes and new mutations associated with the disease. Then they decided to group together to form a consortium of consortium that is called IGAP, the International Alzheimer Genomic Projects. And within IGAP, 
they analyzed more than 74,000 individuals and they managed to uh, detect uh, 19 regions associated with AD, including 11 new regions. So they have published the largest GWAS of AD to date. And if you are interested, you can scan now with your phone this QR code and you will have access to the publication. So now I will present an overview of all the genes that were found associated with AD on this plot. So I will explain what is represented there. So here on the vertical, vertical line here, we have the risk to have Alzheimer's disease. So it goes from a low risk on the bottom to a high risk on the top. And we have here the, the mutation that causes the disease. And here on the horizontal line, we have the frequency of the mutation in the population. So on the left, we will have here mutations that are rare. So what does it mean? It means that there will be in the population few individuals that carry the mutation. So for instance, here in this room, maybe there is only one person that has the mutation. And here on the right, we will have common mutation and uh, so it means in this room, maybe there will be 10 or 20 percent with the mutation. So don't panic yet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so here, uh, the circle will represent the genes. And we will not focus today on the different color. That means something I will not explain today. So the first genes that were identified were the rare mutation that caused the disease. Uh, and they are associated with early onset AD. So there are these three genes that are represented here. So they are rare, as I explained, and they cause Alzheimer's disease. Then uh, the <coughs> gene that was identified for late onset AD is a major risk factor. It is called APOE4. And depending if you have one or two copies of the mutation, then your risk is increased and uh, so the mutation become rare because it's more rare to have two copies rather than one. Then with GWAS, we were able to detect lots of new genes and these mutations were common in the population. However, you can see they only confer a low effect on the risk to have AD. And finally, other studies um, managed to find mutations that were more rare, such as the one described there. However, once again, they confer a risk that was from low to modest on the risk to have AD. So the total proportion of irritability explained by all these genes seems to be around 20%, whereas in the introduction I told you that the irritability of the disease ranged between 60 and 80%. So there is an unexplained genetic risk, and it may be due to some common mutation with small effects that we have not detected yet, or it can be due to rare mutation with large effects that we were not able to detect with the previous analysis I showed you. So now I would like to talk about three particular areas that are the future of genetic analysis in AD and that are uh, the areas that I am working on. So the first topic is a large scale sequencing effort to detect rare mutation. So DNA sequencing is a method that aims to determine the complete DNA sequence of an individual. And this is now feasible on a large scale because sequencing and the cost associated with sequencing has reduced dramatically. So why do we want to search for rare mutation in AD? So as I said before, we think that there are some rare mutation with a strong effect on the risk to have AD that we have not detected yet. We also think that functional deleterious mutation are more likely to be rare. And finally, they can be informative. For instance, if we find a rare mutation in a gene, then we will have some novel insight for the role of this gene in the disease. And we can carry like functional studies, and this gene may be an important target for the development of a treatment. 
So I will describe two public large-scale whole genome sequence initiatives that are the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project, ADSP, and the Transomic for Precision Medicine, TopMed program. So ADSP was created in 2012 with the initiative of the President Obama to create a large-scale sequencing effort to discover rare and protective mutation for AD, but also to facilitate prevention and treatment of the disease. So ADSP is a milestone that is part of the National Alzheimer Project Act. And there has been already different phases in ADSP, so we are at the uh, third phases. And we have received whole genome sequence data for around 4,000 individuals, cases or controls with AD. And I will be involved in the analysis of this new data. The second project is called TopMed, the Transomic for Precision Medicine. It was initiated in 2014 with the aim to uncover protective and risk factor for a broad range of disease, but also with the aim to develop more targeted and personalized treatments. The aim was also to generate deep whole genome sequence data. And in April this year, we have uh, more than 120,000 whole genome sequence that were completed. Within TopMed, with SUDA, we are part of different working groups. So we are conveners for the Neurocognitive MRI Working Group, and we are also part of the Stroke Working Group. The second uh, topic I would like to talk about is the genetic analysis of AD biomarkers. So we have to remember that AD is a slowly progressive brain disease. So more than 20 years before the symptoms appear, there are changes in the brain that can be measured. AD can be decomposed into three clinical disease stages. So the cognitively normal preclinical phase, the mild cognitive impairment, and the most severe phase that is called dementia. And we would like to follow the evolution of particular biological factors that we can measure during this phase, and they are called biomarkers. And they are indicator of the presence or not of the disease or the risk to have the disease. So these biomarkers are dynamic and they are temporarily ordered. So, um, we, uh, the idea is to follow, as I said, the evolution of these markers, but to identify earlier individual at risk to develop AD, and also to provide more efficient treatment to delay or prevent the symptoms, we want to focus on biomarkers that change during the preclinical phase. And we are conducted genetic analysis on this biomarker, and we think that if we find some genes associated with this biomarker, they may point to genes that are important in the AD process. So currently, I am working on genetic analysis for two particular biomarkers, ABDA and Tau, the two hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And finally, the last part that I would like to talk about is genetic analysis of AD endophenotypes. So endophenotypes are intermediate phenotypes, and they are genetically correlated with AD. They can be measured in all individuals, affected or non-affected individuals. So why do we want to study quantitative traits? we think that there are more informative phenotypes than simply considering the affection status alone. And also they provide more statistical power to detect small genetic effects. And the idea is that if we find genes associated with these endophenotypes in the early stage of the disease, we think they may be promising targets for the development of biomarker or preventive treatments. 
So we can study, for instance, structural <coughs> brain changes that can be quantified by MRI, so by imaging. And they can be markers of brain aging or markers of vascular injury. And last year, I conducted some research on three particular brain changes that are listed there. And we did a whole genome sequence analysis within TopMed on the Framingham Heart Study. And we found 12 novel regions, including genes associated with Alzheimer's disease, but also associated with Parkinson's disease. So if you are interested uh, with this paper and also you would like more details, please also scan the QR code here on the left. So in conclusion, the genetic analysis of Alzheimer's disease help to better understand the disease. So for instance, we try to understand how the process of the disease begin. We also try to understand why some individuals genetically at risk to develop AD escape from the disease. With genetic analysis, we identify new genes and also novel pathways that may be promising targets for the development of new treatments. And we are also able to develop genetic risk score that help us to predict uh, if someone will have a risk to have AD and also it um, facilitates the risk stratification that is to define groups of patients that are genetically at risk to develop AD and that can enter into clinical trials. There are also several promising uh, ongoing approaches and I talk about a few of them but there are many more as you can imagine. Uh, I talk about large-scale sequencing efforts to find rare mutation. I also talk about studying biomarkers or endophenotypes of AD rather than studying affection status alone. And we really think that this will help to identify earlier individuals at risk to develop AD. And finally, there are other types of analysis and we call them integrative analysis. So for instance, we try to detect what we call interaction. It can be interaction between, between several genetic mutations. It can be interaction between one particular genetic mutation and one particular environmental risk factor. And even we can study interaction between one genetic mutation and one particular treatment to understand why some people do not respond to one treatment. There are other, other types of approach that involve more actors. I just show you simple statistical model, but we try to integrate more information. We can study different genetic mutation together. We can study multiple genes in a pathway, and they are called systems or network analysis. And finally, beyond um, genetics and genomics, we can study other types of data and we call them omics data. And so everything is to uh, try to integrate different sources of, of information and we try to provide more realistic model and more uh, comprehensive model of the biology underlying AD in order to better understand the disease and to better prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. So finally, I'm not working alone and my work will not be possible without many collaborators. So I really would like to thank them. They are working at Boston University or on the Framingham Health Study and they are also involved in multiple consortiums such as CHARGE, ADSP or TopMed. I also would like to thank the patients because it is thanks to their dedication and thanks to their families that we are able to conduct our genetic research. And um, I would like to thank again Suda for invita inviting me today to present. And of course, I would like to thank you for being there today to listen about more about genetics. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take questions.